Hi guys, so I welcome you all to the today's lecture under the fast track series for RBI grade B 2018 which has been brought to you guys by EduTap. Before proceeding forward, let us briefly look at what this series entails for you guys. So in this particular series, we are going to attain a comprehensive coverage of current affairs from the month of May 2018 to 15th August 2018 that is before your examination. And again in this particular series we are going to alternatively cover topics of ESI that is economic and social issues and finance and management which will be covered through important problems under multiple choice questions or MCQs. Now we have been working in this direction for the past few years and we have been blessed with some of the very amazing results in the past few years. Now in RPA grade B 2017 results 124 of our students they reached the interview stage and 27 of the students they made it to the final list. Now apart from the different other courses which we are running we are offering these courses for RBA grade B 2018 examination so these are the different courses which you guys can choose from so there is a wide range of courses and you can choose according to your requirement. Now in case you need to know more, you have any query, you can always visit our website which is www.edutab.co.in or you can drop us a mail at deepak at the rate edutab.co.in or you can call us at 8146-207-241. So in this video, we are going to cover some of the very important current affairs and events from 15th of May to 19th of May 2018 which have very high chances of being asked in the examination. So let's start with the first one. This is that 15th of May was recently celebrated as the International Day of Families. So this is important that 15th of May is dedicated as International Day of Families. Now this event uh, is celebrated annually and it was initially proclaimed by the UN General Assembly way back in 1993. So this is not something which is uh, very recent. It goes back way back to 1993 when the uh, UN General Assembly passed a resolution or proclamation in this regard. And uh, since then it is being celebrated annually on 15th of May. Theme for this year it was families and inclusive societies. So this is important we have to remember the theme that is families and inclusive societies. Now why do we celebrate this International Day of Families? What is the rational behind celebrating this International Day of Families? The rational is that celebrating this day it provides an opportunity to promote awareness of different issues which are affecting the families in the present day and these issues can be social, economic and demographic issues which are affecting different families as uh, there is going a transition from the old generation to the new generation the families are becoming nuclear and there are other different changes which are influencing the families so we can uh, discuss all those issues uh, using this particular opportunity so now let's move forward uh, to the launch of full-fledged green skill development program so this full-fledged green skill development program was launched recently and this initiative for skill development has been taken up by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. So you guys may get confused when a question is asked in this regard and it says that this was launched by Ministry of Skill Development or Ministry of Labor and Employment or Ministry of HRD but we have to remember that this one has been launched by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and climate change that is MOE F and CC so this is the ministry which we have to remember so this skill development program it seeks to enable India's youth in order to get gainful employment or self-employment utilizing the vast network and expertise of the environment information system portals which have been developed so for this we have to remember that this is an initiative of environment ministry so now let's move to the launch of the national wind solar hybrid policy. So this hybrid policy has been launched recently by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. So this is important that the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy has come out with this wind solar hybrid policy. So this policy is going to provide a framework for promoting large scale grid connected wind solar hybrid system so now we are moving towards hybrid wind solar systems which are going to help in efficient utilization of transmission infrastructure and land so we are thinking that we should set up both of these wind and solar energy production units uh, side by side for efficient utilization of the transmission infra which we are going to develop as well as the land which we are going to 
use in developing the renewable energy so it is going to promote new hybrid projects as well as hybridization of existing wind solar projects it will it will also provide for integration of both the energy sources that is wind and solar at both ac as well as dc level and it also mandates that the regulatory authorities have to formulate necessary standards and regulations for the for the wind solar hybrid systems which we are presently focusing upon so the key focus area of this policy is to come up with a hybrid policy which which in a way uh, utilizes the potential of both wind and solar and leverages the infra and transmission uh, related technologies in each of these sectors in order to promote a better utilization and better provision of renewable energy in the country uh, now there are some related points to this one to the topic of renewable energy uh, so f first one is international solar alliance which is often in news and this is an alliance of more than 121 countries and most of these are sunshine countries which lie either completely or partly between the tropic of cancer which is on the northern side and the tropic of capricorn which is on the southern side now this initiative it was first proposed by the indian prime minister shri narendra modi so this is important in this regard that it is an initiative of india and it was first proposed in november 2015 and it seeks to promote efficient exploitation of solar energy next is about the india's renewable energy target so this is something which we have to remember at any cost that by 2022 india is targeting the installation of 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity so this is the figure which we have to remember which we cannot forget at any cost that 175 gigawatts by 2022 further there are sub targets to this uh, broader target of 175 gigawatts and it includes 60 for uh, large and medium scale solar power projects 60 for wind and 40 for solar rooftop projects and 10 for biopower and 5 for small hydro so overall 100 is dedicated for solar 60 for wind 10 for bio and 5 for hydro so this is something which we have to remember or we have to know the sequence so now let's move to the next news and this this is the news which is the related to that more tests are required for releasing uh, genetically modified mustard so this is by uh, geac which is genetic engineering appraisal committee so center has said that there are going to be more tests for genetically modi modified mustard in order to clear it for commercial use now in this regard these are the two very important terms which which are there in the news and which may be asked in the examination the first one is dhara mustard hybrid 11 this is a genetically modified variety of mustard and this has been developed by delhi university's center for genetic manipulation of crop plants so this is something which we have to remember we have to remember that this is a gm hybrid and this has been developed by delhi university this was created using barnes or baster technology so this is also we have to remember next is about the genetic engineering appraisal committee so this is an apex body which is created under the ministry of environment and forests other very important fact that this is a body which is not under ministry of science and tech this is under ministry of environment and forests and it seeks to promote efficient uh, protection of environment while using genetic technologies so this is something which we have to remember now let's move to the next important news that the first all women post office passport seva kendra is coming up in fagwara punjab so this is important that punjab is going to have the india's first passport office seva kendra run by all women team and this has recently begun its operation so this is important now about this passport seva kendra let us look at some of the very important facts this passport seva kendra is an important government initiative by the ministry of external affairs and the department of posts so these are the two government agencies involved in this passport office seva kendra and whereas the head post office and past uh, post offices are being utilized as the passport seva 
केंद्र फॉर डिलीवरी ऑफ पासपोर्ट रिलेटेड सर्विसेज टू द सिटीजन ऑफ इंडिया सो वी आर सिंपली लिवरेजिंग द पोस्ट ऑफिस इंफ्रा इन ऑर्डर टू प्रोवाइड पासपोर्ट रिलेटेड सर्विसेज टू द सिटीजन ऑफ इंडिया एंड द पर्पज ऑफ दिस वन इज टू डेवलप पासपोर्ट रिलेटेड सर्विसेज इन ऑर्डर टू रीच अ वाइडर कवरेज एरिया बिकॉज द पोस्ट ऑफिस हैव अ वाइड नेटवर्क एंड दे आर स्प्रेड ऑल ओवर द कंट्री so from this news we have to uh, note this point that this first uh, all women pa- uh, post office passport seva kendra is uh, starting starting its operations in fagwara which is in punjab so now let's move to the next one which which is that the china has launched first india dedicated investment fund so china's largest bank which is the industrial and commercial bank of china and it is icbc it has launched the country's first india dedicated publicly offered investment fund so this is the investment fund which is going to be dedicated towards india now this fund is named as the industrial and commercial bank credit suisse india market fund so this is the name of this fund and this is going to invest in the etfs or exchange traded funds which are listed on more than 20 exchanges in europe and us that are based on the indian market so this index this particular fund which is developed is going to track etfs which are listed on different exchanges in europe and us which are based on the indian markets which are tracking indian market so this is indirectly tracking indian markets through european and us stock exchanges so this is going to track the distribution of in- industrial structure across uh, the indian market and the financial industry will account for the highest proportion in this particular fund and this is going to be followed by it alternate consumption energy essential consumption raw material medicine healthcare and other industries so the important facts are that uh, this fund has been launched by china's industrial and commercial bank now let's move to the next one which is that the women officers mountaineering expedition to mount bhagirathi so this is about the mountaineering mountaineering expedition of women officers to mount bhagirathi so this was recently flagged off by the director general of military training on 14th of may 2018 and this expedition comprised of nine women officers and it aimed to encourage women in the field of adventure so this this is important that a women ex- expedition is going to mount bhagirathi and about this mount, mount bhagirathi we have to remember that this is located in the gadwal himalayas in the gangotri national park so this is this is in the himalayas and this is in the gangotri national uh, park so this is something which we have to remember so next is about a study which was conducted recently it was released in the uh, global journal which is the Uh, general lancet global health and it's then the study says that there have been 239000 excess deaths per years of girls under the age of 5 in india so this is something which we need to worry about that there have been excess deaths of girls under the age of 5 in india and this average level of excess mortality in the girls aged 0 to 4 that is they are under the age of 5 in the study period of 2000 to 2005 it was 18.5 per 1000 live births so this is a, this is some of the very important data and this is something which we need to worry about this is something which in india needs to worry about because it is moving towards gender equality and if the things like this they keep happening in india it is going to significantly hamper our efforts towards gender equality and further the study says that the worst affected areas were all rural agriculture areas with lower levels of education high population density and low levels of socio economic development now let's move to the next one which is that the sulab international founder which is dr bindeshwar pathak has been honored with nikai asia prize so in this particular news there are some very important aspects which we need to remember first we need to remember the name of the person which has been awarded with this prize and then we must be aware about what is this nikai asia prize now we are already about this sulab international we are already aware about this one so we have to remember that the founder of sulab international has been honored with the nikai asia prize and this is in japan so this is very important that the country associated with this prize is japan and this prize has been awarded for his contribution to asia's development so dr pathak he has described as indian social reformer and he has tackled two of the india's biggest challenges that is poor hygiene and discrimination 
so this is something which we need to remember now let's move to the next one which is about the fourth meeting of seven which was held in kolkata so we need to be aware about uh, this seven which is south asia wildlife enforcement network so we need to be aware about that there is a network for south asia wildlife enforcement and its fourth meeting was recently held in kolkata so this was the first meeting of seven which was held in india since its inception in 2011 and it was its first ever meeting in india and it has adopted many resolutions to curb wildlife crime in this region so this is something which we need to remember now this seven is a south asia wildlife enforcement network is an intergovernmental wildlife law enforcement agency so this is something which we need to remember that this is an intergovernmental agency it is not an ngo it is an intergovernmental agency and it was launched in january 2011 in bhutan and its secretariat lies in Kathmandu, nepal now there are eight south asian countries which are part of this network and they include afghanistan pakistan india nepal bhutan bangladesh sri lanka and maldives so this is we have, this is the information which we need to remember about the south asia wildlife enforcement network because it can be asked in the examination now let's move to the next one which is the international rail coach expo so first ever international rail coach expo was recently held in chennai tamil nadu from 17th to 19th of may 2018 so this expo was hosted by Inter integral coach factory under the ministry of railways in coordination with confederation of indian industries or cia and rights limited which is a psu under the ministry of railways now this expo it provided a unique platform to different uh, suppliers under one roof and create synergy to promote make in india with respect to the railway infrastructure sector so for this particular news we have to remember that this was organized in chennai tamil nadu and it was hosted by integral coach factory now let's move to the replace campaign which has recently been launched by wto and for this we have to remember that this campaign has been launched by wto to eliminate trans fat in foods by 2023 so uh, the world health organization is promoting healthy food habits and trans fat is something which is very dangerous to our uh, health and this is something which we need to eliminate and for this purpose this replace campaign has been launched so they, through this re, uh, replace campaign who seeks to eliminate industrially produced artificial trans fats from the global food supply by 2023 so that we are able to consume only healthy fats or healthy food this replace is abbreviated in six strategic actions so this replace is a short form and it stands for review promote legislate assess create awareness and enforce so this is replace now this campaign it provides a step-by-step -step guide of replace packets so that we can uh, in a prompt complete and sustained manner achieve the elimination of industrially produced transfers from the global food supply so this is something which we need to remember that this replace campaign it has been recently launched by wto and the objective is to eliminate trans fat in foods now let us briefly also look about the world health organization now this is a specialized agency of un concerned with international public health it was established in 1948 and is headquartered in geneva switzerland and who is also a member of the undp and it is responsible for releasing the world health report worldwide health survey and world health day is also observed under the ages of world health organization now next one is about the atal pension yojana subscriber base crossing 1 crore mark so as per the recent data which has been released by the pension fund regulatory and development authority subscriber base of atal pension yojana which was launched in 2015 by the ministry of finance to address different risks risks among the workers which are working in the unorganized sector has crossed 1 crore subscriber mark so this is something which we need to remember that the subscriber base of atal pension yojana has crossed 1 crore subscriber mark and the top three states in this mobilization they were uttar pradesh followed by bihar and tamil nadu so this is something which we need to remember that ubt that is uttar pradesh bihar and tamil nadu top in apy 
Now let us also briefly learn about this Atal Pension Yojana. It was launched in 2015 and it is open to all bank account holders who are not member of any statutory social security scheme. Small finance banks and payment banks they can also offer this Yojana. Uh, contribution which is made by the subscribers under this Yojana depends on the age and at the age of 60 years the central government would also co-contribute and depending on the contributions which uh, the people have made throughout their life till the age of 60 years they are going to get pension in this regard uh, there is no exit to the scheme before the age of 60 and the minimum of a minimum age of joining is 18 years and the maximum is 40 years this is administered by the PFRDA that is Pension Fund Regulatory and Development Authority recently Aadhaar has also been mandatory to get benefits of Atal Pension Yojana next let's move to the inauguration of integrated center for crisis management by the president Ramnath Govind recently so this integrated center for crisis management it has been inaugurated recently at BARC that is Bhabha Atomic Research Center in Mumbai Maharashtra now this integrated center for crisis management this is going to help the nation respond in a more effective manner towards chemical biological radiological and nuclear emergencies now if we talk about BARC that is Bhabha Atomic Research Center this is India's premier nuclear research facility and it is based in Mumbai Maharashtra so this we have to remember that this integrated center for crisis management has been established at BARC and this BARC is located in Mumbai Maharashtra now let's move to the Bharat inclusion initiative which has been recently unveiled by IAM Ahmedabad so IAM Ahmedabad center for innovation incubation and entrepreneurship that is CIIE has recently launched this Bharat inclusion initiative which is going to focus on building knowledge and fostering innovation and entrepreneurial activities across different areas like financial inclusion livelihood education and health so this is basically to promote an inclusive India in different sectors be it education be it knowledge be it innovation be it entrepreneurship and this initiative aims to channelize approximately US dollar 25 million over the next three to four years towards backing up the startups which leverage the ongoing digital transformation in India so we are going to provide funding support to startups to the tune of US dollar 25 million as a part of the Bharat inclusion initiative now this CIIE which we just discussed it was set up in IAM Ahmedabad in association with the government of India and Gujarat government to provide seeding and incubation support with a focus on technology and mass impact areas so about this particular initiative we have to remember that this is launched by IAM Ahmedabad and this is the dollar 25 million initiative now let's move to the next one which is that the India has emerged as the third largest solar market in the world in 2017 so this is as per the recently released report by Mercom communications that India has emerged as the third largest solar market in the world in 2017 behind China and US so these are the top two markets and India is on the third India has set a new record with 6 9.6 gigawatts of solar installations in 2007 and in 2007 India solar market had grown at a compounded annual growth rate of approximately 170 percent since 2010 so this is something which we need to remember that India is the third largest solar market after China and US now let's move to the next one NTPC has recently signed MOU with the government of Bihar so this MOU has been recently signed to improve the performance of power sector in Bihar and the MOU envisages transfer of three power generation facilities in Bihar to NTPC so that it can efficiently uh, it can efficiently monitor it can efficiently guide those uh, power generation facilities and promote efficiency in power generation in Bihar so these units they are Baroni thermal power station Kanti Bijli Utpadan Nikam limited and Nabi Nagar Nabi Nagar power generation company limited so this NTPC is a Maharatna company under the Ministry of Power Government of India and it is the largest power generating company of India so this is uh, some of the very important information about NTPC which we have to remember and we have to remember that this has recently signed an MOU with the government of Bihar to improve the power sector in Bihar through transfer of three power generation facilities 
Now let's move to the next one which is that the WHO has recently published its first essential diagnostics list. So this is important we can be asked at which of the following agency has recently come up with the first essential diagnostic list. So we have to remember that WHO has come up with this list and this essential list it concentrates on different kinds of tests which are needed to diagnose the different medical conditions. Now this contains overall 113 products out of which 58 tests they are for detection and diagnosis for a wide range of common conditions and 55 tests they are for priority diseases such as TB, HIV, Hepatitis B, Hepatitis C, Syphilis etc. And for each category of test the list specifies the type of test, the intended use and the format for health facilities within laboratories. So we have to remember that WHO has come up with this first essential diagnostic list and it has overall 113 products therein. So next let's move to the next one which is that the cabinet has recently approved the national policy on biofuels 2018. So the salient features of this policy is that it categorizes biofuels into three categories and they are basic biofuels which are the first generation biofuels like bioethanol and biodiesel. Second is the advanced biofuels which are the second generation biofuels like ethanol which are produced from municipal solid waste etc. And then there are the third generation biofuels. Now this classification it is made to enable extension of appropriate incentives which are to be offered to each of the categories of biofuels and this policy seeks to expand the scope of raw material for ethanol production. So it says that we are not going to restrict the raw material for ethanol production and we are going to allow the use of sugar cane juice, sugar containing material like sugar beet, sweet sorghum, starch and fit for human consumption for ethanol production. So this policy is going to promote biofuels in the country and this national policy on biofuels was recently uh, was first released by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in 2009. So this genesis it's related to 2009 and the union cabinet has recently approved the 2018 policy on biofuels. Next let's move to the establishment of National Institute of Mental Health Rehabilitation. So the most important aspect of this one is that where is this institution located? So this institution is located at Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. So Union Cabinet has recently approved the establishment of this National Institute of Mental Health Rehabilitation in Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. So it is going to be established as a society under the Societies Registration Act under the Department of Persons, Empowerment of Persons with Disabilities. So this, uh, this facility it is going to provide rehabilitation services to persons who are suffering from different mental health disabilities. Now in this regard national mental health policy is also important and it was announced in October 2014. Next let's move to the setting up of a central university in Andhra Pradesh. So union government has recently given its approval for establishing a central university in the name of Central University of Andhra Pradesh in Janthaluru village of Anantpur district in Andhra Pradesh and for this purpose a provision of funds worth rupees 450 crores has been approved. So this approval this is going to increase the access towards high quality higher education in the region of Andhra Pradesh. Now let's move to the next important news item which is about setting up of a new AIMS in Diogar which is in Jharkhand. So we are coming up with a new university in Andhra Pradesh and we are coming up with the new AIMS in Jharkhand. So union government has approved the setting up of a new AIMS in Jharkhand and for this purpose funds worth rupees 1103 crores have been approved and this institution is going to be set up under the Pradhan Mantri Swasthya Suraksha Yojana. This Pradhan Mantri Swasthya Suraksha Yojana was initially launched in 2003 in order to correct the regional imbalances in the availability of quality medical education. This is two components which is setting up of new aims and upgrading the government medical colleges. So an important aspect of this news item is that we are going to set up new aims in Jharkhand and this is going to be set up under Pradhan Mantri Swasthya Suraksha Yojana. Now let's move to the next one which is that the BSC or Bombay Stock Exchange has become the first Indian stock exchange to get US Securities and Exchange Commission's DOSM recognition that is Designated Offshore Securities Market 
designation. So this Bombay Stock Exchange has become the first Indian exchange to get this particular designation and this designation is going to allow the sale of securities to US investors through trading venue of BSE without registration of such securities with US SEC. So, so this is the significance of this recognition that trading uh, of securities to US investors is going to become easier, easier with this recognition. Now let's move to the recent approval towards the corpus for micro irrigation fund for NABARD. So recently cabinet committee on economic affairs has approved an initial corpus of rupees 5000 crores for setting up of a dedicated micro irrigation fund with NABARD under Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana. So these are some of the very important facts that the corpus will be rupees 5000 crores and we are going to focus on setting up of a micro irrigation fund. And this is going to be set up with the institution NABAT and the Yojana or the scheme associated is Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sanchai Yojana. So allocation of 2000 crores and 3000 crores will be made in a phased manner in 2018-19 and 2019-20 and NABAT is going to extend the loans to state governments from, for this period and the borrowings from NABAT shall be paid back in 7 years including the grace period of 2 years and the lending rate under this has been proposed at 3% lower than the cost of raising the fund by NABARD. The cost shall be met from the ongoing scheme of Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana and, and the total financial implication on interest subvention under this scheme that is since we are going to offer lower rates of interest for this one it is going to be around rupees 750 crores. So we have to remember that we are coming up with a micro irrigation fund worth rupees 5000 crores with NABARD. Now the next news item is about a discovery of a new frog species in small industrial region in coastal Karnataka. This discovery is being described by the team of Indian scientists in the International General Zootexa and it is named as such that is Microla Kodial after the city of Mangaluru which is called Kodial in the Konkani language. So about this particular species we have to remember that this is a frog species and it has recently been identified in coastal Karnataka. Now let's move to the next one that is the 18th of May is International Museums Day. So we started our discussion in this video with the International Day of Families on 15th of May. Now we have moved towards the International Museum Day which is 18th of May. Now theme for this year it was museums and hyper communication new approaches and new public and this event was coordinated by the International Council of Museums. So the significance of this event is that it provides the opportunity for different stakeholders associated with this particular sector or the museums to meet the public and alert them that the different challenges the museums are facing these days. So next let's move to the establishment of Directorate General of Trade Remedies by the Commerce Ministry. So Government of India has carried out an amendment to the Government of India Allocation of Business Rules and it has substituted the Directorate General of Trade Remedies in place of Directorate General of Anti-Dumping and Allied Duties in Department of Commerce that is Ministry of Commerce and Industry. So this is something we have to remember we may be asked a question that which of the following institution has recently substituted the Directorate General of Anti-Dumping Duty and Allied Duties in the Ministry of Commerce. So this is Directorate General of Trade Remedies. So we have to remember this particular information. This Directorate General of Trade Remedies, it is, it is going to be the apex national authority for administering all trade remedial measures like anti-dumping, countervailing duties and safeguard measures. So this is going to bring the Directorate General of Anti-Dumping and Anti-Dumping Duties, Directorate General of Safeguards and Safeguards uh, functions into the fold of just one single national entity that is Directorate General of Trade Remedies or DGTR. Now next let's move to the recent projection which has been made by UN World Economic Situation and Prospects Report. So it says that India's economy is projected to grow at 7.6% in fiscal year 2018-19 and this is going to make Indian economy as the fastest growing economy in the world. Further it says that the GDP growth in India is expected to be 7.5% in 2017-18. 
Now, other key highlights of the report: it says that in 2017, world economic growth reached 3% level, which is the highest growth level since 2011. and this global growth is expected to remain steady at 3% in the coming 2 years and it says that the few least developed countries they are expected to reach their sustainable development goal targets for gdp growth of at least 7% in the near term so this is important that even the small nations are progressing progressing in sustainable development goals further this report calls for creating a new financial action framework for sustainable financing in alignment with the 2030 agenda associated with the climate change so this is something which is also important so next one is about a development of a new device to detect and remove arsenic content for from water in order to make it safe and usable by households now this is a collaborative effort of indian institute of science education and research in collaboration with the private sector companies and this device is going to play a key role in detecting the arsenic levels in the water and to remove the contaminations of arsenic from the water as per the who the permissible limit for arsenic in ground water is 0.0 mg per liter and in india it was revised by bias from 0.05 mg per liter to 0.01 mg per liter so we have to develop that this device has been uh, developed by indian institute of science education and research this we have to remember and we have to remember the limits with respect to arsenic in ground water by who and in india next let's move towards the appointment of uttam pacharne as chairman uh, chairman of lalit kala academy so president ramnath kovind has recently appointed uttam pacharne as the chairman of lalit kala academy and he is going to hold this post for a term of 3 years now this lalit kala academy of the national academy of arts is india's national academy of fine arts it is an autonomous organization and it is established in new delhi and this seeks to promote and propagate the understanding of indian art in and outside the country this lalit kala academy it is funded by the union ministry of culture and it is headquartered in new delhi so these are some of the very basic points with respect to lalit kala academy and about the appointment of uttam pacharne which we have to remember for our examination now the next one is about the recent tweaking of norms with respect to setting up of international financial services center banking units by banks in international financial services uh, center so according to the new norms which has been released by rbi the parent bank will be required to provide and maintain at all times a minimum capital of us dollar 20 million to its ibu or ifsc banking unit so the parent bank will be also required to provide a letter of comfort with regard to extending financial assistance as and when required in the form of capital liquidity support to ibu and these guidelines are going to be applicable to ibus which are going to be set up in gift city gujarat as well as in other ifses or international financial services center which may be set up in india so this is about the strictening of norms with regard to setting up of ifsc banking units in international financial services centers in india so if you briefly look at the background to this one Uh, the international financial services centers they cater to the customers outside the jurisdiction of domestic economy and these centers they deal with the flow of finance financial products and services across borders and in india the scz act of 2005 it allows setting up a international financial services center in an scz or as an scz after approval from the central government Gujarat International Finance Tech City Company Limited or Gift City is being developed as the country's first international services center so this is very important information which we have to remember next is about the approval of draft cavery management scheme by the supreme court so the supreme court has recently approved this draft management scheme for distribution of cavery water among the four southern riparian states which are Karnataka Tamil Nadu Kerala and puducherry so this is something which we need to remember we need to remember the fourth uh, riparian states associated with the kaveri river and we must be aware about this broad scheme that is kaveri management scheme which has recently been approved by the supreme court now next is that the anil kumar jha has been appointed as the cmd of coal india limited 
So Anil Kumar Jha has been appointed as chairman come managing director of Coal India Limited and he has been appointed to this post till January 31 2020 Mr Jha is currently the CMD of Mahanadi Coal Field Limiteds and he has replaced Coal Ministries additional secretary Shri Suresh Kumar So this we have to remember that Anil Kumar is the uh, appointed as the CMD of Coal India Limited Now let's move to the next important news item which is related to the World Health Statistics 2018 which has been recently released by World Health Organization. Now as per this India has saw an estimated 211 cases of TB people per 1 lakh people in 2016. So this is uh, about the burden of TB in India and it says that India saw estimated 211 cases per 1 lakh people in 2016. Now in this regard it is important to acknowledge the efforts made by India towards a TB free India. India has pledged to eradicate TB by 2025 five years ahead of the global target set by WHO. TB remains a high burden disease worldwide and even for India and we need to make substantial progress to tackle all the gaps with regard to this implementation. and the WHO's annual world health statistics report it also presents most recent health statistics for WHO member states now let's move to the next news item which says that the india's fresh water stocks are in danger so according to a recent study released by nasa india is among the hot spots where overuse of water resources has caused a sharp decline in the availability of fresh water so So in India there have been an overuse of water according to study by NASA and this can bring the fresh water stocks of India in a danger. This study it was published in the general nature it has found that wetter part of the earths were getting wetter and dry areas were getting drier so this is something which is worrying this is something which we need to work about in northern india groundwater extraction for irrigation of wheat and rice has led to depletion despite a rainfall being normal throughout the period studied so with regard to northern india it says that the groundwater extraction is the dangerous one it, and it has affected the entire economy of the region now this team it used 14 years of observation from gravity resource and climate ex- experiment spacecraft mission or the grace spacecraft mission so for these findings this uh, 14 years of observation of this particular spacecraft mission has been used and this grace spacecraft mission is a joint project of nasa and germany to track global to track global trends in fresh water in 34 regions around the world Now the next one is about the adoption of Ayush word that is the Ayurveda Yoga Naturopathy Unani Siddhi and Homeopathy by the Commission for Scientific and Technical Terminology so this is a commission which is related to terminologies and this has adopted the word Ayush in Hindi and English languages for scientific and technical purposes Now this commission for scientific and technical terminology it was first established in 1960 by the government of India with the objective of developing and defining scientific and technical terms in hindi and all the indian languages so this has adopted the ayush term for different scientific and technical purposes so this is a positive news for the ayush sector or alternate healthcare sector in india next is about the starting of services with regard to the parcel cargo train connecting northeast to the western region of india So recently Northeast Frontier Railway has started operating one lease parcel cargo express train and this is train is going to run on fortnightly basis and it is going to connect northwestern parts of and northeastern parts of India to the west coast the route of this parcel cargo express train is new guwahati in assam to kalyan in maharashtra so this is going to connect the western region of the country with the northeastern region of the country Now let's move to the next one which is about the advisory being issued by the Indian Meteorological Department to five states and one UT with regard to Sagar cyclonic storm. So IMD has issued advisories to Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, Goa, Maharashtra and Lakshadweep with regard to this cyclonic storm Sagar and this cyclonic storm it has been developed as a low pressure area in Arabian Sea and it has gained strength and it has intensified into a depression and later in inter- it turned into cyclone Sagar. It is the first cyclonic storm of season to develop in Indian waters. Now let us also briefly learn about the naming of cyclones 
and the two important global institutions related with this are world meteorological organization and un escape that is un social and so economic and social commission for asia and the pacific so they started the tropical cyclone naming system initially in 2000 and it was felt that tropical cyclone should be na named in order to provide ease of communication between the forecasters and the general public now the cyclones which happen in the north indian ocean basin are named by the indian meteorological department and overall eight north Indi uh, indian ocean countries they are uh, they are associated with the naming of the cyclones and each country gives eight names which are combined into a list of 64 names which are then used in order to name the cyclones and the name sagar which, which is given to the current cyclone has been given by india now the next one is about uh, the recent BRICS ministerial on environment which was recently organized in durban south africa now this ministerial it has agreed to include green good deeds in its official agenda for the next ministerial meeting in brazil and another meeting in russia now this concept of green good deeds this campaign of green good deeds it was initially launched by the union minister of environment forest and climate change that is dr harshwardhan in january 2018 and the union ministry of environment it uh, draw up a list of over 500 green good deeds and it asked the people to alter their behavior to green good good behavior to fulfill their green social responsibility so this is about green social responsibility the fulfillment of green social responsibility and this has been recognized by the BRICS ministerial so now the next one is about the inauguration of Kishan Ganga Hydroelectric pro Project and the laying of foundation stone of Pakal Dul Power Project in Jammu and Kashmir by the Indian Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi has recently inaugurated the Kishan Ganga Hydroelectric Project and it has laid the foundation stone of Pakal Dul Power Project in Jammu and Kashmir. So a direct question can be framed out of this that this hydroelectric project is located in which state and the foundation stone with regard to Pakal Dul power project has been located has been laid down in respect of which of the following states. So this is the information which we need to remember. This Pakal Dul with 1000 mega capacity it is going to be the largest hydro power project in Jammu and Kashmir on completion. It is also the first storage project in JNK and the 330 megawatt Kishan Ganga hydroelectric project is a run of the river scheme and it is located in Bandipura district of JNK and this scheme is going to provide free power of 13% to the state. So this is about the key features of this inauguration, this launch of the Kishan Ganga hydroelectric project and Pakaldul power project. So guys, this is all about our discussion on some of the very important current affairs from 15th of May 2018 to 19th of May 2018. Thank you guys. If you found this video useful, please like the same and share it with your friends. And for more similar videos, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Thank you.